Good afternoon. Welcome to the, <coughs> the third in this um, U3A spring series of, 19, oh, of 2022. So, as per the last series, It's a typo. Apologies. Don't trust your computer ever. <laughs> You're right. Okay. <clears throat> so this, this series is being streamed live on YouTube. Frog in my throat. Um, so you can have a look at it again if you like. Uh, so then the streaming allows us to reach the, the people that don't feel able to come out at the moment. So we're actually getting a nice, nice broad audience out of this. Plus... Um, we're getting 70 or 80 people watching it afterwards as well. So in, in terms of um, the exposure that um, this venue is creating for us, it's, it's quite good. So the toilets are to the left and the right. If you go right, you turn right again. If you turn left, head towards the gymnasium. Uh, please either turn your cell phone off or turn it to silent. In the event of emergency, um, once again, turn left or right, meet in the car parks at each end. Take a break for afternoon tea after about 50 minutes or so, um, and then come back and there will be an opportunity for questions. If you've got a question, uh, there's some forms at the desk, please write it down. Um, if you end up with an, an auxiliary question, we will bring you a microphone um, so that you can be heard by everybody else here. Right, so our speaker today is Associate Professor Philip Steer from the School of Humanities, Media and Creative, Creative Communications at Massey. That's my old department, but you've changed the name. I don't recognise it anymore. <laughs> so his topic, the forgotten poetry of, of the colonial environment. Now, Philip's research focuses on the culture, economics and environment of settler colonialism, colonialism, especially in the 19th century Australia and New Zealand. His current work explores the idea of settler literature in the form of environmental knowledge, and asks the colonial past, and asks what the colonial past might tell us about the cultural dimensions of present day environmental problems. Even as colonization devastated the environment, settlers wrote poetry about nature. This presentation will demonstrate how paper's past is transforming our understanding of New Zealand's literature through a tour of some of the striking locations and subject highlights in this writing. We'll explore the idea that poetry was an important form of settler environmental knowledge alongside science and economics. Philip's out of, out of a literature world with poetry. I come out of a, a world with film and I can't help making this, um, a, a comparison because it's, there's no doubt whatever that the country, the environment that we live in is, influences how we write, how we see things. And the, and the best example, I mean, I, you know, um, if you look at New Zealand, what we've done to our um, environment, things like coal mining at Deniston, gold rushes in Otago, and the worldwide and the widespread felling and burning of the bush, what they contributed to what we've got today in terms of environmental issues. And, and I can't help draw a similarity to, if you if you want to look at um, New Zealand films, a good example. Um, the film that we see in New Zealand very much depicts who we are, where we came from, the environment around us. I'll give you some examples. It conjure up an image of um, films such as The Piano, Utu, or Vigil. They're quite dark, they're quite moody, and, and they actually very much depict, reflect what New Zealand, New Zealand, New Zealand filmmakers see and therefore depict in their work. So it's my pleasure to welcome Philip to speak to you on the topic of colonial poetry. Thanks, Philip. Kia ora, Graham. Thank you very much. Wait for the sound to stabilise. All good. 
Kia ora, Graham. Thank you very much for the, the kind and uh, helpful introduction. And uh, tēnā koutou to all of you here in person and also those of you watching online. Uh, it's lovely to be amongst you. Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation to be here and to Stuart for his uh, efficient and helpful organisation through the whole process. I'll just start by acknowledging the mana whenua of Rangitane over this place, as well as the hospitality of the Crossroads Church, whose um, space we're meeting in, and also, um, in terms of the dollars and cents, uh, the Marsden Fund, who's um, sponsoring or supporting my project called Settler Environments, uh, from which uh, my paper is drawn today. Uh, so, so just to start by introducing myself a little bit, uh, ko Tarikaka te monga, ko Parirua Stream te awa, ko Emma Colvin te waka, ko Philip Aho. So I grew up in Johnsonville, one of the northern suburbs of uh, Wellington, in the shadow of a mountain that we called, when we were kids, Mount Cow Cow. It uh, has a giant television transmitter on top. Uh, and my father used to make us go on these forced marches up there in weekends uh, through the, the bush to the, the, the gorse and the pasture on the tops there. Um, more recently, we'd have learned to call it Mount Coco, spelled K-A-U-K-O-U, but that in turn is likely a, a, a corruption of kaka, as in the parrot. And uh, the original name of that mountain is not Cow Cow or Coco, but Tarikaka, the, either the resting place of the kaka or maybe where the, where the kaka get hunted. Uh, so, so that's my mountain, I guess. In the northern suburbs of Wellington, there are no major rivers, but the, the most significant waterway is a stream that flows from quite near where my family lived uh, in Johnsonville out to Porirua, the Porirua stream. And uh, I grew up uh, with a stream uh, in a piece of bush, sort of at the bottom or the side of our property, which I always imagined was uh, part of the Porirua stream, a tributary. But it turns out on closer investigation that it's um, not a named stream according to the, the Wellington Regional Council, but is in fact an open drainage system. It emerges out of a concrete pipe quite near our property, and prior to that goes under the motorway, uh, High One. So uh, not the Porirua stream near my property, an open drainage system, but, but nearby to the Porirua stream. And then on my father's side, uh, we actually very recent arrivals to New Zealand. He immigrated from England in the 1970s to teach history and never went back. Um, he first taught at Tower College where he was met on his arrival by a colleague saying, what do you call 12 dozen palms? To which the answer was a gross ignorance. So that was his welcome to New Zealand once he started teaching. But on my mother's side, my origins stretch much further back to the mid-19th century, uh, when Henry and Mary Prestige and their four children arrived in Nelson in the 1850s on the Emma Colvin. One of their sons purchased land in Kaponga, so in Taranaki, uh, which had been confiscated from Taranaki Māori back in the 1860s. They moved there in November 1881, which is the same time, same month, that Parihaka was being demolished by colonial troops. So, so this is, I guess, one version of uh, a, a Taranaki landscape from the 19th century. This is another that I show my students a little later from 1905, uh, a postcard um, with, with, with the hand annotation. P.S. Some of the scenery we behold. And so the reason for kind of working through my pepeha with you uh, and then presenting this image is to kind of uh, try and convey a sense of how, how the, the formulation of the pepeha the orientation of myself to the environments that are significant um, is very closely related to the work I currently want to be doing and thinking about our relations with, with the environments we live in and how culture shapes our understanding of the environment and also what we do with it. And what intrigues me about this image is that language. This is the scenery we behold. And I'm curious to know would the settler or the Pākehā who wrote this annotation on the postcard see the same kind of scenery that we are seeing? Would they be seeing a devastated forest? Would they be looking over that? Would they be seeing a future of pastoral land? 
So these are the kind of questions I'm quite interested in. This is only just over a century ago. How similarly are we seeing the landscape to our ancestors? Um, to what extent have we inherited their landscapes? To what extent do we actually think a lot like them, even if we feel we're quite different? Okay. So to get towards my talk, and I will note I've already had one complaint about poetry already, so we're off to a good start. Um, what I want to do is to introduce my topic by way of a short story in three parts. And the short story is called What is New Zealand Literature? I promise it won't be a long story. Okay, what I want to just do is situate the kind of work I'm doing and we'll be kind of presenting to you in terms of um, how it might feel different or why it's newer um, compared to some of the ways that these questions have been explored in the past. Okay. All right, so the first part of the story starts with a work called A Book of New Zealand Verse, 1923 to 45, chosen by Alan Curnow, a poet and a critic from the 1930s and 40s, who you may well be familiar with. Okay, and so, so I start with this because this is kind of the version of New Zealand literature that I was taught as an undergraduate a couple of decades ago. Um, essentially, that story goes that New Zealand literature done well, was only invented in those 1930s and 40s by writers such as Curnow and Glover, another poet, Frank Sargison, the short story writer. They were working in this new style called modernism, and what they were able to do, they felt, was, was finally use the English language in a way that was truly local, truly belonged here, rather than being kind of tainted fatally compromised by the sentiments and conventions of Victorian England. Okay. So, so they, they told a story about themselves being the origin point of proper writing. And that story was reiterated and, and pretty much um, maintained right through until, you know, well into this century. Um, you know, with with increasing questioning around the values of that writing, but nevertheless the idea that the sort of starting point would be somewhere around that kind of uh, sort of first quarter to half of the 20th century, and what was before then was of little interest. Okay. And this is the version I kind of grew up with. While I was studying for my PhD overseas, uh, this book came out. Jane Stafford and Mark, Mark Williams' Māori Land, New Zealand Literature, 1872 to 1914. And that, that's a quite a useful guidepost for us because you can, tell by the, you can tell by the dates on the book cover that um, the, the critical goalposts have shifted back from that 20th century period into the 19th century. Okay. So, so what they are doing is saying... Previously, we have overlooked the writing from that 19th century period because it's kind of embarrassing for us. It's, it does have that feel of being kind of a bit, a bit twee or a bit tainted by uh, overseas writing or conventions not truly being um, original to this place. And they were sort of trying to say, actually, it's worth a second look. That the questions that writers in the 19th century were exploring were quite similar to the ones that later writers have also taken up and been concerned with. So, so the, the, this is the second part of the short story of New Zealand literature, is shifting our focus back into the 19th century to say, well, actually, it might be worth looking at again. So that's, that's the, the sort of the first move I want to kind of just put before us. But at the same time, as that second bullet point might indicate, um, what they're doing is still a very um, traditional kind of literary scholarship, which is that you, you look at the books that were published, right? And they're likely to be rare in a colonial context, so you're likely to find them in special collections, libraries, you know, kind of locked away, hard to access, um, and, and have not been read much. But nevertheless, the focus is still very much on uh, books that have been Bound, you know, printed work that's bound between covers. Um, and then the third movement that actually occurs contemporaneously with this, but literary scholarship is still trying to catch up on, I think, would be this, which um, this is 
the papers passed version, that second version that launched in 2007, that many of you will be familiar with if you have a local history interest, an interest in family genealogy, trying to figure out who your people were back in the 19th century, first half of the 20th century. So, so clearly this database of freely available and searchable newspapers is primarily you know, of interest to historians, to genealogists and so on. But it also turns out to be of, of importance to those of us thinking about New Zealand's literature. Okay. And it has the potential, I want to just sort of start by saying, to, to shift our understanding in quite profound ways about what that writing was, who was doing it, where it happened, and what its kind of cultural role was. Okay. And Papers Past tells us the story that uh, writing, creative writing was being done on a much larger scale and by far more authors than we've really grappled with before. Okay. It shifts our focus from those printed books in the special collections libraries to the periodical, to the newspaper especially, also to magazines, but especially to the newspaper. It also shifts our focus from novels, which have been privileged in a lot of literary study for various reasons I won't go into right now, but you're welcome to write a question if you're really interested. But it shifts our focus from the novel to poetry. And you can understand why from a newspaper's perspective, publishing poetry would, might be of much more interest than publishing novels, because they're shorter, you, do, you know, they're sort of done in one go, okay, um, they're simpler to deal with. But, but the flip side also of that is that poetry writing was much more appealing, it seems, and more widely undertaken than we might have previously thought about, okay. And the other thing that Papers Past does is shift our perspective from what we call canonical writers, the ones who kind of have a kind of prestige or whose names get remembered, the ones who seem to have a kind of a national significance of the kind that would be discussed in a book like this. Papers Past shifts our attention more to much more local writing. The local newspaper is the kind of community of readers and writers, okay? And what you find is that a local newspaper will have a range of people writing poetry for it. Some will be sporadic. Most of them will be using initials or pseudonyms, which is frustrating. Um, but some will have a few regular contributors who are often sending in poetry. Um, and they sort of are kind of local presences in their, their local readership. Okay. The poetry that you find in these newspapers from New Zealand writers will tend to be labelled original poetry, and we'll see some examples soon. And that was to distinguish it from the, um, the other poems that were reprinted frequently in these newspapers from overseas sources, from British authors, uh, especially Tennyson, American authors um, such as Longfellow and Bret Hart, uh, Australian authors such as Henry Kendall. Their works would often be reproduced um, and, and often what you find also is chains of transmission, where a poem is republished or published for the first time in one newspaper, and then it is kind of picked up and reproduced around the country as the papers, copies are circulated. It is still material from each other. Typos uh, emerge and so on. But so there's, there's a kind of, it's a quite an interesting and complex community of reading and writing and republishing as well, okay. The other thing that's kind of fascinating, I, I find, is that we tend to think now of, of creative writing as being quite separate from other spheres of culture and activity. You know, you're not going to find poetry in a newspaper, right? Or in a scientific journal. But, but the example of the newspaper shows us poetry right alongside news items and advertising. It appears in scientific reports. Uh, it's a much more um, intermixed cultural sphere than we have now as well. Right. So that's more than enough preamble. What we're going to do now, and I'll keep an eye on the time hopefully, um, is I'm going to take you through a number of different locations, each of which has a poem attached to it. 
to do with a different kind of environmental theme or concern, and I'll just situate the, the, that concern, present a bit of the poem to you, and just give you, um, give you a taste of some of the variety of what we're looking at, okay? And um, it's in sections, so I can stop if I'm going on too long, okay? So the first place we're going to start, and it's kind of roughly in chronological order. So the first and earliest place is, is Auckland. Okay. But Auckland, in particular, in relation to the industry of milling, felling and milling kauri trees. Okay. So this is a, a, an image from the 1840s of a kauri milling camp, actually uh, in the Kaipara, so a little north of Auckland. But nevertheless, um, so the point being that Kauri is being milled quite actively from the 1840s in the northern part of the North Island. Uh, there's an international trade springing up for it. And certainly in Auckland, which is where this painting is of, uh, from, again, the mid-1840s, uh, there's, there's very much a, a sense of Kauri forests being on the, the fringes of settlement. Okay. So... In New Zealander, in October 1853, we find this original poetry, The Kauri Trees, by an author who is identified as St. George. Okay. I'll talk about St. George in a minute, but first of all, I'll just give you a taste of this poem. There's a couple of excerpts on the screen. Um, they raised their stately heads in pride are all the forest trees, their shadows lingered on the tide of circumambient seas. The bright sun kissed them as he rose high in the orient heaven. To them, at daylight's loveliest close, his parting beams were given. In velvet glades, by gushing streams, their giant growth was found. Such has been dreamt in poets' dreams and called enchanted ground. No human foot, no human hand, th those virgin groves had soiled. Fresh as they sprang at God's command when earth's first morning smiled. Profoundest silence shrined them round, the air itself breathed awe. The faintest sigh, the lightest sound broke nature's mystic law. Where are those silent forests now? Keen axes glance and ring, while loud beneath each sheltering bough the hardy woodsmen sing. They make the freight of gallant barks to many a distant shore and many a foreign landsman marks the stately height they bore. But never can man's art restore those beauties once profaned, those forests where the garb they wore when priceless nature reigned. And that's possibly the first time that poem's been read out loud in over 150 years. So I'm not, well, I'm not sure if it's worth the wait or not, but there you go. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't applaud my terrible efforts. But St. George... It was the, the student of Frances Shale George. She arrived in Auckland in 1850 with her solicitor husband, Thomas, and she had one son. Her husband turned out to not be much use, certainly in the financial side of things. She was very literate. Uh, she wrote a letter called uh, From a Settler's Wife that was published on Charles Dickens' Household Words in England in 1852. And that was the same year she opened a co-educational primary school in Auckland. She had a collection of poetry published in 1855, which very much drew on the, po the poem she was publishing in her local newspaper. She went on to be a pioneer of girls' education in Auckland. Okay. And this, as far as I'm aware, is the earliest poem we have about kauri trees. There are several throughout the 19th century. This seems to be the earliest. Um, and so the first thing is that... that these forests, this tree, was deemed worthy of poetry. Right? You know, someone is, is recognising this as something that's an appropriate subject for this kind of writing. We have, a, in some ways, quite a familiar setup here. It's, it's what we'd call a kind of a romantic, big R romantic kind of writing that sets up nature as being very pure and very separate from humanity. And you will have heard maybe some of the the, the kind of imagery of, of the forest being set apart and quiet and outside of history even, okay? And, and what the poem, though, also does is talk about what happens when settlers turn up. And on the one hand, 
it's quite ethnocentric because it imagines there's no history here before the settlers arrived. This is not a forest that's had any human presence. So there's that issue. At the same time, though, what the, what the poem is also doing is trying to imagine, I guess, the value of a forest like this in some terms other than its economic value. Okay. So as I mentioned, um, these forests are being cut down and traded globally from the 1840s. Uh, visibly, you could see the forest starting to change around Auckland at this time. So, uh, steam milling was being introduced in this decade as well, so the rate of deforestation is increasing. And so the poem, in this, this early period of settlement, is establishing this contrast between a kind of poetic or aesthetic kind of value for this forest versus its economic value. Okay. And this is not like an abstract idea because in the same newspaper at a different month, we find these kind of uh, news items. So this is from the Sydney Commercial Intelligence. And it's just, you don't have to read the details, but it's a list of the price of the different kinds of kauri timber being sold in Sydney at the same time. So this poem appears in a newspaper that's also presenting information about what this timber is worth. And so we can think about this poem perhaps as a kind of intervention into this um, wholesale environmental change that's occurring. Let's move a little north for our second example, to Whangarei Heads, to the Daily Southern Cross, also an Auckland newspaper, and a poem called The Lament of the Last Moorpork by someone who I have no idea who they are called J.H.A. Okay. And this is one of the, the small number of poems we have that are about the extinction of animals going on in New Zealand. Okay. And so I'll just give you a little taste of this. It's a long poem. Um, it's also notable because it has a degree of kind of anger about it that you don't find in a lot of colonial writing talking about what the colonists are doing to the place. Okay. Um, and it's, it has a kind of introduction and then it imagines the last more pork speaking. Okay. So just a few lines from the introduction, first of all. For from the sordid stranger there hath issued a command that the fairest and the loveliest be swept out from the land, and first to death of all condemned amidst the feathered throng, the owl, his nightly chant no more, pours forth the woods among. The last of all his murdered race, one only bird remains, and thus to wood and mountain he with mournful voice complains. So there's the, the kind of introduction to the last Moorpork speech. And it, the Moorpork will carry on at some length, and it will say, "'Twas he who with claws so deadly concealed in his hidden lair, as they flitted amongst the bushes, tore the denizens of the air." See how the imported songsters in the woods expiring lie, and entrapped by the rat Norwegian in countless myriads die. I hear that terrible death shriek, the last wail of that ill-fated line, and exult in their race's extinction as they exulted in mine. So environmentally it's quite complex. It's this, this last owl imagining or reflecting on the fact that rats are killing off all the birds in the forest, including the ones that have been brought to acclimatise to New Zealand and also displace the indigenous birds. So it's kind of looking at this kind of this kind of um, you know, wasteland of dead birds of indigenous and introduced species and blaming the rat for it. I'm no ornithologist, but I do know that more porks aren't extinct, right? So there's some poetic license, literally and figuratively going on here, two kinds of poetic license. One is it's misidentifying the owl and it's misidentifying the rat, okay? So the, the Norwegian rat apparently is not the one that kills off birds, it's the ship's rat, ratus, ratus. But, but more significantly, there's our owl that is becoming extinct, the laughing owl, okay. Uh, the feco, uh, which has apparently a loud cry made up of a series of dismal shrieks frequently repeated, 
and its repertoire supposedly included doleful shrieks, a prolonged cat 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 which could go on all night, uh, a call similar to two men cooing to each other, or a barking noise just like the yelping of a young dog. The kind of thing that intrigues me, there's several things. One is, is the, the willingness to name extinction in this kind of quite graphic way and to identify an ecological cause for it. The other is that the laughing owl at this point seems to be largely in the South Island already. So why a poet based in Whangarei Heads is writing about this in such a way, I don't know. If you've got ideas, please tell me. But so, so this is a species that will become extinct throughout New Zealand early in the 20th century, but seems to largely already be gone from the North Island at the time of writing. Let's move south for our third example, to Blenheim. The only time we'll get into the South Island today, actually. Okay, so here is Blenheim in the 1870s. Okay, the Blenheim Wharf, okay. And what I want to introduce with this little taste of colonial poetry is the question of flooding and the way that settlers saw this as a problem of infrastructure and how even then they were grumbling about their local councils to fix the problem. So Blenheim, from its earliest days of settlement, had the nickname or the name of Beaver or Beavertown or Beaverton because of the, how wet it was numerous rivers that frequently would overflow their banks, okay. And it only gained the name of Blenheim in 1859. And then you have this kind of, um, in 1859, when the Marlborough Provincial Government is established, and then Blenheim and Picton are having these big fights over who's going to be the, the centre of the government for the province. And so, so these kind of political battles are going on throughout the 18. Uh, 60s and 70s, and in 1868, uh, Blenheim is devastated by a flood, and here we go, the great inundation of the Waido. Um, it's, a, it's a news item that's sort of told around, around the country, around the colony, uh, the worst they've experienced in 1868, okay. And so, two years later, we find this poem here in the Marlborough Express. Original poetry again, a voice from the flood. And you'll see there, upside down, the pseudonym of typo, or devil, okay. Right. So a little bit from this. And this, the previous two poems we've, we've read have been quite serious in tone. This is a deliberate parody, or satire, I guess. What are our councillors doing, brothers, the whole day long, while the floods bring wreck and ruin with a power fierce and strong? Where's the cash they were going to borrow to stop the overflow? A draught of water's pleasant when you are very dry, and pleasant is the purling brook that murmurs gently by. But oh, these dirty waters, so drumly and so brown, they're neither sweet nor pleasant that inundate the town. The poet said, I know a bank whereon the wild thyme grows, and I too know another bank o'er which the Opawa flows. O oh, say, Lord Henry, where's the cash you all were going to borrow, or shall the flood I moan today be free to return tomorrow? So, typo suggests to us possibly this is one of the editorial team or one of the journalists because there's a little joke about the printer's devil, which is one of the kind of apprentice roles in the newspaper office. The fact that it's been uh, set upside down suggests that the printers are in on the joke as well. It had some special attention. That's just a speculation. But, but that certainly the Marlborough Express editorially has quite a critical view of, of um, the council's response to some of these issues to do with flood preparation and so on. Uh, the reference at the end to Lord Henry, he was the mayor of Blenheim at the time, so he's the one who's kind of being blamed for not following through on his promises um, around kind of securing the cash to build up the stop banks and so on. So, so here, here what we're seeing is, is a different kind of response to an environment, which is that it should be, you know, we expect it to be controlled, right, and to be brought, um, to be tamed, and 
to allow settlement to continue where we want it to, rather than you know, consider if we're in the right place or not. Okay. And just as a little footnote to this, you find a few years later, um, when the council is looking to create a new seal, the newspaper comes back to these questions of beavers and floods and suggests this should be the seal for the Marlborough Council. It has a beaver on the top, and the, the, the editorial that goes with this talks about how the beaver has a paddle-like tail, and the Marlborough motto could be paddle your own canoe. In the kind of wavy lines, it says, refer to the floods that used to kind of devastate our town. So the kind of ongoing kind of cultural debates, I guess, around flooding are occurring in this poem, participating in it. We'll move closer to our own territory now, over to Woodville. Okay. So by way of this beautiful artwork by Sarah Featon, okay, um, who was uh, based in Gisborne, and she and her husband produced uh, this remarkable book called The Art Album of New Zealand Flora, uh, which basically bankrupted the publisher. It was so expensive to produce. But she did these stunning illustrations, and this is of various kinds of rata flower. Okay. And, and the reason that I bring this image before us is because the poem that I've spent a bit of time trying to think about, uh, this one here, appeared in the Hawke's Bay Herald in the late 1870s, so a little before that painting, um, by someone who identifies as H, and it's called To the Rata, or Gigantic Myrtle of New Zealand. So published in Woodville, or identified as being written in Woodville, rather. O glorious myrtle in thy crimson robe, thou wraps the hills, the valleys, and the plain. A grander picture I did ne'er behold, supreme in beauty, Thou dost truly reign. Upon the mountain top thou flingest wide thy robust arm to tempt the furious breeze. But though it fall upon thee in its might, unharmed thou standst, a very king of trees. When now the scorching perpendicular rays of summer suns do bid us seek the shade, where can we find a lovelier retreat than neath thee, monarch of the forest glade? Sweet there to watch the tui dippers bill into the deep recesses of their flowers and sip the honeyed nectar to his fill, then warble forth sweet melodies for hours. And were I now about to lead my love unto the altar where we might be wed, a myrtle spray among the daisies twined should be the bridal wreath upon her head. When at the last I lay me down to die, and loved ones seek to decorate my clay, while on my bier the snow-white lilies lie, among them let there be a myrtle spray. So it's an intriguing poem because of the emotion of it and the personal connection that's being expressed. Right. H, we know helpfully from the editor of the newspaper, is Stephen Hutching. The editor talks about the fact that he sends lots of poems and most of them are unpublishable. But he says this one displays true poetic feeling and is at the same time freer from technical defects than any of Mr. Hutching's other pieces that we have seen. So it's a bit better than the others, they think. Stephen Hutching arrived in Woodville just two years earlier, and he and his family had immigrated to New Zealand in 1873. So recent arrivals to New Zealand and to Woodville. Okay. And so there's this very strong emotional connection being expressed, and it's deemed worthy enough or legible enough to be published. But what I find extra challenging about this poem is the context in which it's being published and read, which is this kind of thing. This photo is taken just a year later, near Woodville. So obviously Woodville's within the 40 mile bush, which extended from Woodville south to Mount Bruce, or Pukaha, and, and that itself was part of the wider 70 mile bush, which extended to the coast and as far, you know, far into the southern Hawke's Bay. And was being systematically decimated at this time right? um, through you know, Scandinavian immigrants and others being promised land in exchange for converting or clearing the land to, to farmland. So what I find intriguing about this is the coexistence 
of this very kind of affectionate response to the forest and to one particular tree in the forest alongside this wholesale you know, ecological devastation as the Waitangi Tribunal described it. So, so kind of paradox is emerging for us. And we have one more stop before a conclusion. Okay. So the last stop is White Island. Okay. Which, you know, has been in the news a little bit over the last few years for understandable reasons. And in the 1870s, uh, sulfur was being mined on White Island. And then in the 1880s, that, that enterprise further expanded. And it seems also that tourists started to visit White Island in the 1880s. Here's a tourist boat departing the island. You can see the hazardous landing they're making. Here are some, um, some late Victorian tourists picking their way around the coastline of White Island as well. Okay. So the poem that we're going to look at briefly again is a poem of this tourist experience of the island. Um, it seems that you could hire, hire a steamship to go out. Some others would sort of, on regular routes through um, kind of coastal trade, would maybe drop people off. But so it's part of a network of kind of tourist experience. And this is what this poem describes. Uh, in the same newspaper, uh, in the same issue, there was a, a prose account of the visit that these tourists made to the island. Um, it doesn't unfortunately identify who wrote the poem about that experience. Okay. But so I'll just read a little bit of this as well. Okay. So it, it's addressing the experience of being on White Island. And the pseudonym Staffer is the name of the steamship that took them there. Volcanic Isle, their fame worldwide has spread. Mysterious crater of deep scented fire with fleecy steam clouds billowing overhead, tossed up whatever by thy pent-up ire. Thy riven portal, through its open door, admits the traveller to a rock-strewn beach. We land in haste, thy beauties to explore, prepared to learn whate'er thou hast to teach. Upon thy many tinted hues we gaze, with growing wonder, but words fail to tell our admiration, as the sun's bright rays illume each cliff and jutting pinnacle. Yet still we gaze spellbound as forth in clouds or noiselessly rolls up the rushing steam, which ever and anon the rock enshrouds like moving phantom of some baseless dream. At length we tear ourselves away to view the varied wonders every turn displays of boiling lake and pool of strangest hue, which hissing weirdly fill us with amaze. Farewell, Lone Isle. We shudder at the thought of all the fiery power pent up in thee, lest it some day should shatter thee to naught or hurl thee headlong in the encircling sea. So it's that conclusion that kind of chills me, the, the description of happily being a tourist on the island, yet also, just as you leave, just imagining what if it blew up, right? And clearly that is very much to fore now these days as we think about White Island. Um, but, but you, you know, you may be already aware, of course, that um, it wasn't, it was only a few decades later that that did occur as well in 1914. At that point, sulphur mining was, undergo, you know, was a significant undertaking on the island, and part of the crater wall collapsed and buried the mining camp and killed 10 miners. And so... The, the poem, I guess, anticipates the potential for that disaster while yet still not being willing or able to really imagine it as a likelihood. And so the reason I, I, I sort of draw that to our attention is partly because I guess we're sort of reliving or remembering or going through the same kinds of experiences and reflections to do with that particular place and how, how we relate to it. But as a postscript to do with that disaster from 1914, I came across this as well, which you won't be able to read, except that you might see the, the headline, Liability of employee, Employers, Difficult Question. And essentially, this is following the 1914 disaster, 
there's a Workers' Insurance Act in place, and there's a legal dispute breaking out over whether the insurance company should pay out for the harm done to the employees because of whether or not the volcanic eruption could be predicted. And the, the article describes how there's been no obvious examples of volcanic activity for several decades, so could it reasonably be expected that this volcano would explode and kill the people working there? And, and you know, in a slightly different way, of course, these are also debates about our environment, how we understand it, that are still continuing or still with us today. All right, to wrap up with a very brief postscript. Okay. I guess if I was trying to, to sort of draw some academic conclusions from this, I, there's a few I'd highlight. One is that I think we're, we're attuned to read this kind of poetry as quite sing-song, kind of frivolous or sentimental or shallow sounding stuff, right? But, but what I want to suggest is the amount of poetry being published in these newspapers and the range of environmental subjects, they, they sort of challenge us to rethink that, that response a bit. Because their response is shaped by you know, our own expectations of what writing should be like. And, and what I want to suggest is that possibly in, in that colonial period, poetry was one of the main, or perhaps the main, language by which Pākehā, by which settlers, could think about and value the environment in ways that weren't defined by science or economics. So it's performing an important cultural function, even if it's a kind of a minority report on the environment. It's still a visible one. It's still one that is being read and propagated and thought about. I also want to highlight the diversity of responses. Just in these examples, there's, there's been a range from wonder to affection, bemusement, concern, there are a range of these, and, and the more you read in this kind of area, the, the wider range you get. Okay. And of course, the other thing to highlight would be the, you know, the, the absence of any Māori voice or perspective. And, and it's not just that it's only Pākehā or settlers writing these poems and being published, and, but it's also that there's, there's little in the way of a willingness to acknowledge Anyone else might have been here. Anyone else might have had sentiments about these places. Anyone else might have knowledge that's worth sharing. Okay. Um, and I know you've already had a, a lecture or a, a, a dialogue around Mataranga Māori, and I want to, to kind of just connect us to that conversation a little bit. Uh, because, you know, you might be thinking, well, you know, you're reading a, a kind of a 21st century view onto this, right? But, but I guess I think what I want to just finish by saying is that settlers w had perfect capacity to be aware of this and to think about it if they wished to, because we do find evidence that this is occurring. So the final little exhibit for us is not from a newspaper, but from the transactions and proceedings of the New Zealand Institute, which have become the Royal Society. This is an article read in the Wellington Philosophical Society in 1892 by Robert Coupland Harding, based in Napier, who was a typographer and a literary kind of a figure. Uh, he worked with Colenso. And this is an article, this is a, a paper he read in response to some papers he heard at the Royal Society that were saying that Polynesian writing or literature, stories, poems, narratives, were not worth the name of literature. They had no value scientifically or culturally because they were too kind of backward and old-fashioned. And his response is to kind of go through at some length and suggest why this might be a somewhat mistaken view. And he finishes with this kind of concluding note. Poetry, some will persuade us, is the outcome of imperfect development. Certainly with the advance of material science, the higher forms of literature seem to be less appreciated. In other words, as we get more modern, no one values literature of any kind, right? This applies to art of every kind, he says. We may yet find, and you'll find here that he does use the language of primitivism, so just kind of understand the context. 
but we may yet find that there is something to admire in the uncivilized man and even something to be learned from him. As a typical example of the ghastly side of human progress and science, we have only to look at the desecrated Manawatu Gorge, where nature is taking effective revenge for the outrages inflicted upon her. Primitive man lived nearer to nature than we do today and understood her better than we. Primitive man has left us from remote ages a legacy of literature that we cannot now surpass. So it's a complex argument, saying in general literature can say things about our environment that maybe science and progress can't. But also it's saying, are we so sure we fully understand this place? Are we so sure we have the words and the ideas, the language to describe it and understand it accurately? Because look what we're doing. Look what's going wrong in our environments. Maybe we do need to look to indigenous writing, to mataranga Māori, to find some other kinds of ways of thinking and expressing ourselves. So the challenge was there. It's a minority voice, but it was there. So it's with these complexities that I'd like to, to leave us in conclusion. Thank you for your, your attention, and I look forward to any questions you might have after the break. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Okay, so we'll break for a cup of tea now. We'll be back here in 15 to 20 minutes. Um, if you've got a question, write it down at the desk there. Thank you very much.
All right. Welcome back. So we've, Philip's got a few questions, so we'll, we'll deal with those, and then um, I'm aware there's at least one other question from the floor that I'll bring you out a microphone. If I bring, when I bring you a microphone, make sure that you speak into it. They don't work so good unless you're speaking right into it. Well, thanks for making it back after the break. Um, so, so one of the questions here is, what type of people contributed th these poems and were they overseas educated? And, and I think, so two parts. One is that there are a range of different kinds of people. You know, you'd have, yes, church ministers, uh, school teachers, but also farmers um, and, you know, uh, just regular people who feel moved. A lot of them are women. Um, and so you might not say that they had a, you know, an occupation other than being in the home, but, but of course, clearly, um, that is a, you know, a really important part you know, of, of the colonial economy, of colonial life. Um, and, and so you've got a huge range, but of course, they are all able to kind of write in a recognisable verse form. So there's a degree of education that's a prerequisite for, for being, um, being able to be published. Because these editors are really tough. They will of, often write in their editorial columns how they've received this, this submission from someone and it's completely unpublishable, you know, or they need to go back and try again. It's very kind of public, often sort of shaming of bad poetry as well going on. So it's a risky business. Um, were they overseas educated? Uh, this shifts a lot over the course of the century. So, so clearly in the first sort of middle decades of the century, they will all be overseas educated because they're all newly arrived. But as the century progresses, you'll find you have more and more people who have grown up in New Zealand, have been educated in New Zealand. Um, but again, it's still mixed. So it's, is it the 1880s or 90s that you first have, a, of the settler population, the majority are born in New Zealand, but of course a lot of those will still be very young. So it's quite a, a, quite a fluid and changing demographic. But so you're diverse, but definitely educated range of um, genders and occupations. And the second question, um, do these examples indicate the presence of a conservation movement in the 1800s? And it's a really good question. Um, so kind of yes and no. So, so partly it depends on what you mean by conservation. So I think definitely these poems and other kinds of writing do indicate that there are people who are concerned about this environment and, and feel very upset at how it's being transformed. They are still a minority, though. But what you do find in the last couple of decades of the 19th century is an increasing concern with erosion as a threat to the nation's farmlands and to the settlements where people live. And this comes out of the United States. There's a, there's a scholar called George Perkins Marsh who writes a book called Man and Nature. And his basic thesis is that if you look at the classical world, the Mediterranean, wherever you see a desert, there used to be a forest. And someone like the Romans cut it down, and then all the water went away and it all dried out, and now no one can live there. And, and what he says in that book also is that you see these processes occurring in the new world, the colonised world, at a faster rate than you do in the classical world. And so this book kind of got taken up all over the empire and across America and Europe and so on, and including in New Zealand. And it was quite influential in parliamentary debates and movements. Uh, there were various kinds of legislation that started to try and preserve areas of forest, especially highland forests and so on, um, because of the, the kind of economic threat that was um, perceived to be seen from deforestation, destroying uh, good land further downstream. So that's, that's the kind of most visible kind of conservation movement. The second one that you get much closer to the end of the 19th century is what's called scenery preservation. So that's where, um, it, it's not in terms of, a, not conserving an ecosystem, but conserving an experience of the landscape. 
So, so there's a commission set up to kind of, and given legal powers to kind of designate certain remaining areas of forest and other kinds of landscape um, and to kind of preserve them. And, and the, uh, the historian and ecologist Jeff Park talks about how Māori sometimes used this legislation to try and preserve some last parts of their land by essentially trying to get it designated as a sort of a scenic area or scenic reserve. So they would lose control, but by, by kind of getting it into the crown system and being legally recognised, it might be preserved. So that would be the second kind of conservation movement. The third would be Arbor Day, which does kind of take off in the 1890s, including in places like Shannon, it was a very early uptake. And so what you find is Arbor Day is essentially people looking around saying, crumbs, where have all the trees gone? We need some trees um, to be a civilised society and to stop erosion and things. So they start to plant generally introduced trees to try and replace the ones that they've, they've kind of chopped down all over the place. So that's a, that's a kind of more of a grassroots, so to speak, kind of a, um, or tree roots kind of initiative. Um, but so scenery preservation and concerns about erosion are the big environmental concerns, but they're not ecologically minded as such. They're different kinds, but, but they're still about preserving. And if you look at your maps today or you drive around, you'll see scenic reserves. And those are, those are you know, legacies from that late 19th, early 20th century kind of movement towards preservation. So thank you for the questions. Are there others that people would like to yeah, ask? John, have you got one? Um, and, well, fuck. And I, um, I, I remember a paper years ago by Rollo Arnold, in which he he, he demonstrated that, that that New Zealand settlers imported a very remarkable number of pianos, and uh, the, the <coughs> and of course when you, you know you. You don't have a radio, and as you do, we do. You don't. We didn't have a gramophone. You, you know, people got around a piano and sang. And I wondered how much you might have noticed of, uh, of, um, of, of, of lyrics, which were written for singing, and you know, um, to, to the tune of something or other. Yeah, that's that's an interesting yeah. question. Um, I haven't seen much in the way of song lyrics, but there's a lot of poetry that's written in Scots dialect, yeah, so yes. especially in Otago, that is often to the tune of, and it will be a ballad or some other kind of traditional air. Oh, yes. So you do see a lot of those kind of yes, verses. Yes, yes, there's that. Yep. Yes, I think Jesse Mackay was, sort of, yeah. was and um, did something in that area. Yeah, and then in terms of newspapers where I primarily work, no, I wouldn't, but something like the Triad magazine, Oh which, yes, um, which is starts to get established in the like the 1890s, I think maybe 93. Yeah, yes, and yes. is um, published all over New Zealand, and then it gets into Australia as well. And that is edited by a music critic, so it's got a lot more music commentary and discussion of lyrics and performances than it does of literature. Actually, it's quite a musically focused publication. So that would be another place I'd be thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. And then otherwise, you know, if you're reading a novel from the time, it might refer to, you know, people singing a certain kind of song or something around the parlour or whatever, maybe in passing, but I can't bring you to mind of specific examples. Mm. Interesting question. Just, I just think it's an interesting area for... Yeah. ..which, which uh, could be followed up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah thanks, John. But, but, but thank you very much for all you've said. I, will I appreciate it. appreciate it very much. Thanks. Yeah, the, it, it appears to me that the early colonial settlers were actually on a hiding to nothing from, from the point of view that they came to New Zealand, were granted land, which they had to clear to farm, but by clearing it, they caused the problems. And so, you know, really, the, the whole thing, um, the original vision was what caused the issue, and it's probably still causing the issues today. Anyway, I'll hand this over to Stu. Thank you, Karen. 
Well, we, we aim in this series to try and give four different perspectives on a general theme. And uh, I'd have to say thank you very much for giving a perspective that hasn't been covered in the other papers. And I think it's extremely valuable. Among other things, it's great that you gave a strong plug for papers past. Yeah. Because for any of you wanting to, to get an impression of what it was like here 150 odd years ago, to read a complete newspaper cover to cover, see the, not just someone's taken a quote from somewhere, but the, the overall context and the sort of thing like, as, as you say, the poetry that you get in there. And there are some uh, articles talking about decrying the, the, the forest being cut down and so on. A lot of the, the sentiment that we see now, some of those were also being voiced in, in, in those times. And uh, I think it's, it's great that we've got this, uh, uh, your presentation that indicates a lot of those sorts of things. Uh, and it is important that we see, as, as you say, science could be very clinical and dry and so on, but there's a lot more, even in, in, in Western perspectives, looking at the emotion about things and the commitment to things and the feelings that come along with that. So for, for presenting that, we're, we're really grateful for the perspective that you've given. Uh, I found it fascinating and, uh, and really enjoyable to, to hear your talk. So on behalf of everyone else, thank you very much. And we have a small oh, thing to, to recognize you. that. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we have the, the last seminar in the series next Wednesday. It's uh, Jeff McNeil, uh, who's talking about changing meanings of the environment in New Zealand. Now, he's far more the contemporary policy sort of area, the issue of sustainability, resource management act, and the, the problems of taking some of these ideas and concerns, and how do you actually put them into practice through a legal, economic, and other structure so as to actually minimize the harm and, and maximize the benefits? And these are very tricky areas, and I'm sure we'll hear a lot of the problems with that, if not the successes, uh, next week. Okay, so hopefully we'll see some of you either here or online next week. Thank you very much.